Uh, in quantum mechanics, the electron is a wave. And it's coming in. And it has a wavelength and it has a frequency. And that's its energy and its momentum. The frequency is the energy, the wave length in that direction, one over the wavelength is the momentum. There's a remarkable symmetry. You cannot observe the wave of the electron. You can only observe what we call the probability to find the electron. And that's what you get by squaring the wave function. And therefore, all the information for just an electron that's oscillating through space gets lost when you square it. And so you could say, well, why, does, why do I ever have to talk about this wave if I can't observe it? This is a long business of quantum mechanics, but you can ask that question. And uh, for a long time, people just said, put up with it. That's the way quantum mechanics works. But then they got smart, and they said, well, suppose that we've got this wave coming in, and then we just at some point change the wave. It's got a certain frequency, and, which we can't observe directly. It's got a certain momentum we can't observe directly. Uh, let's just change it to a different momentum and a different frequency. But we have to conserve momentum and energy. We know that from any note. And we find that we can do this if we invent a new thing called a gauge field. So when we make this change in the wave function of the electron, we also turn on the gauge field. And the gauge field is a wave with a frequency and a momentum. And the momentum is the sum of the two, and the energy is the sum of the two. So the symmetry principle is that that, an electron with some wavelength and some frequency, with a gauge field moving along right on top of it, is indistinguishable from an electron with a different momentum and energy and no gauge field on top of it. That's a symmetry. So people put that symmetry in and they said it exploits the fact that you just can't really measure the wave function of the electron. You measure the square and the square sort of cancels this out. This is a blended thing. The square of this looks like a square of that. But the thing by itself is quite different. Once they did that, they realized something really spooky happens. If you kick the electron at the moment that you change it and send it off flying in that direction, the gauge field will be left behind going in that direction. And it, now you can separate the gauge field away from the electron. And you can start to look at this thing and that thing starts to become physical. In particular, if an electron comes in, that this instant changes into electron plus gauge field, but recoils, and the gauge field goes over here, it can blend with another electron to become an outgoing electron. And that is the electromagnetic force. That's the underlying symmetry principle, and that is the basic Feynman diagram in quantum mechanics that describes the electromagnetic force. It's the same with quarks. A blue quark, you can rotate in color space, but you can take the blue quark and rotate it into a red quark and superimpose a thing called an anti-red blue gluon. And that's indistinguishable from this, as long as the quark is just sitting there in space. But if the quark recoils when you do that, you will shake off blue, anti-red. And that blue, anti-red will combine with red, giving out the blue. And these rotations are happening in a three-dimensional complex space. Remember I told you that's the three-dimensional complex sphere. It's SU3. And it has eight rotations, uh, eight generators. Mr. Lee, the guy who went mad, who figured all this stuff out, would count eight generators for SU3. And there are eight gluons. And we can actually do experiments and see gluons. We, we have a lot of collisions. I took down all the pictures here, but you see the pictures of jets coming out of collisions. The experiments, you see quarks coming out, the gluons coming out, and then they don't. The strange thing about this force, well, this force gets weak. It goes like one over r squared. This force doesn't get weak. Uh, this force is actually constant when you separate the quarks, and the reason is. The electron has an electric charge, and it can shake off a photon. The quarks have color, and they shake off gluons. But the gluons also have color, and the gluons interact with themselves. And that 
produces a really strange phenomenon that as you separate a quark from an anti-quark, the force doesn't fall off. The flux lines are, if I have an electron and, and an anti-electron, I get this one of these dipole fields that looks like a magnetic field. If you separate them, it just fades away. But as you separate the quark and the anti-quark, the dipole field of blue collapses into a string, flux tube, and, and then you just, it costs you more and more energy to separate them. And then this flux tube snaps by making new quarks and anti-quarks. It's very complicated. What do I mean by anti? Oh, by the way, we now know that all forces are gauge forces. This was discovered in the 70s. There's also the weak force, where an electron can turn into a neutrino plus a gauge field. If you, kick, if you kick the neutrino, the gauge field will be emitted, and it'll turn it up or it down. That's what's happening in this process. All forces, including gravity, are gauge forces. And that is remarkable. Before 1970, if you look at te textbooks on particle physics, they're a mess. There's a weak force, and there's a strong force, described completely differently. And in the 1970s, it all came together under this principle of gauge invariance, symmetry. I mean, you know, if the 